I have seen the devil in many forms, but the devil whose blue eyes have smiled upon me in this little town is that most dangerous of Lucifer's. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. I get the pleasure today of talking about a really enjoyable read, Valeria and Her Week of Wonders by Vitislav Nezval. Also, the movie of Valeria and Her Week of Wonders by Yahomil Yirish. This is available, thankfully, from none other than the Criterion Collection on Blu-ray. Go pick it up. But before I talk about the movie, let me talk about the book. The book I read first. Uh, in some ways, I wish I had watched the movie on its own first because it has its own feel. It follows the storyline fairly closely. All the main points are there, but there are some things that are dropped that the author, Nez Vall, really fills in for us. This is one of those books that's just a lightning fast read. It's in the manner of a gothic novel, and you can tell that Vitislav Nezval really appreciates the genre and wants to just have fun with it. Between the book and the movie, there's enough material here in less than 200 pages and a barely over one hour long movie. There's enough to give a Freudian a lifetime supply of dissertations. It all revolves around the young girl, Valeria, who in the book is 17, but in the movie is a, a much more illicit uh, and plausible <laughs> 13 years old. Very implausible that this is happening to a 17 year old. Uh, nonetheless, this is her coming of age, crossing from girlhood into womanhood. It involves her awakening to the sensuous or desire, lustful desire, carnality, that sort of awakening that is fraught with both allure and horror. The book was written in 1935, but it was not published until a decade later in 1945, uh, as we have it in the nice essay that's included in the back of the book from Twisted Spoon Press. The liner notes or the, the booklet that comes in the Criterion Collection is written by a senior editor at NYRB, Jana Prickrell. She says that it was published in 1935, but written earlier. So sort of conflicting uh, information between the two essays there. Nonetheless, it was at the height of the avant-garde of uh, Czechoslovak surrealism. But again, it's the book is just plain fun. And it opens up with an author's note where Nezval basically tells us, hey, listen, I wrote this because I can't get enough of these gothic horror stories. And so I just want to write one of my own. And I hope that you'll enjoy it. It isn't parody and satire on the level of, say, Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. But it isn't the tidy, repressed, more serious vein of, say, Henry James's A Turn of the Screw, which is one of my favorite books, by the way. It's somewhere in between the two. Nonetheless, it's highly atmospheric. You know, there are mist-shrouded courtyards and people carrying candles that are constantly guttering and threatening to go out. There are crypts and tombs and coffins. And throw in all the family secrets and mysteries and invisible inked messages that start to appear when you get them close to a flame. The whole ceremony of Catholicism and the weight that is put on virginity and purity and chastity. Then throw in some hints at cannibalism and throw in some vampires and you're getting close to what we have here. I first sat down to read Valeria and her Week of Wonders thinking I would you know, immerse myself in it, maybe about 50 pages or so. Uh, again, it's only 200 pages. I ended up reading it in one sitting because it's just so enjoyable. And the way that the narrative reads is extremely quick. So it just hurdles you along all the way to the end. The author isn't trying to lose us in the abstractions of symbolism. This isn't uh, automatic writing or trying to dig down in a trance and get at the things that are in the bottom 
of our subconscious and get those onto paper, sort of like Andre Breton and others championed. It's a very linear and traditionally written story with lots of dialogue and constant action. But in the end, there is enough ambiguity and uncertainty to leave us stimulated. And in fact, to make us want to read it again. And sure enough, there were a few things that I thought that I understood that I really didn't. Uh, and the second read <laughs> proved very fruitful. In fact, I read it through again the next day. It's even though it's 200 pages, it's definitely a one sitting type novel. I think that it would be most fun, especially while it's cold outside, is to read it at night with a fire going, if you can, with some hot tea or whatever your hot drink of, of, of choice is. Perhaps go uh, the Scandinavian route and get some glog. As the essay that comes with the Criterion Collection tells us, this could be considered a surreal polychrome coming-of-age vampire costume drama. Again, that's from senior editor at NYRB, Jenna Prickrell. The sets in this movie are extremely vibrant and lush. And in fact, as I was reading the book and thinking about how this would transfer onto, onto film, I kept thinking about Dario Argento and his giallo films, which are like classy slashers um, with people speaking Italian and really cool upbeat soundtracks from his band of choice, Goblin. I thought specifically of Suspiria. And it's not quite uh, in that vein. It has a beautiful score with eerie Gregorian-like chanting and then it'll go to this festive calliope music and then to just these strange disparate noises and then cloying strains with these beautiful compositions. It does have that lush, vibrant character of Adario Argento. The symbolism is beautiful. Everything is swathed in white. Uh, we see the blood drops that kind of set everything into motion appear on the white petals of a flower that she picks from the ground. Later, after the festivities at a wedding, we see a, a turned over wine glass and the wine, the dark red wine has stained the white tablecloth. So we're picking up on all these symbols. And then there are just some bizarre moments. There's uses of jump cuts that I didn't expect at all to disjoint the narrative and give this kind of jolt that we you know, that I would have expected from a cult horror movie. Uh, and in many ways, this could be considered as such. It did come out in 1970, so it's got some age on it that we would be more prone to notice today. But it's still a very effective film. Like I said, there are these gorgeous compositions. It's a very elaborate set design, costuming. <laughs> I think the probably the most striking overall composition is when Valeria attends the service of the virgins early in the church and we see the priest-like figure standing on the parapet, I guess it's called, I'm not sure, looking down on them. But there are just moments when I can, I can picture that figure's face and then on the ceiling behind, you know, the symbol of peace, the dove, um, but the, the lighting, everything is blended so beautifully that you can't take your eyes from the screen. If you like these stories of figures who go and, you know, discover secrets in some castle with hidden passageways and false walls and subterranean crypts, if you like that feeling of the stranger who comes to town uh, and is turning people against one another, or just in general, the lightning fast combination of images of the sacred and the profane, then I think you'll really love Valeria and her Week of Wonders by Vitislav Nezval and the movie by Yaromil Yuresh. I have once again learned that one of the most fraught and terrifying experiences one can have in this life is that of a young girl coming of age.